Hey, turn your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 4. If you're new with us this morning, again, for I think the third time, I'd like to say welcome. We're glad you're here. This is Vista Church. My name is Brandon. We've been here a total of three weeks now and uh, still getting everything worked out, getting these lights figured out. We're going to get them mounted and stuff. So give us some time. Be gracious with us in terms of figuring out this facility and all the things that we need to do. And I hope the parking lot is, is uh, working out for you. Um, and if not, like I said, it's a great opportunity to burn a couple thousand calories wor working your way up to the, uh, the auditorium, right? Yeah. Um, and we teach through the word here at Vista. So if you are new with us this morning, um, we teach through the Bible verse by verse. And I am right now teaching through, as you can tell, through the book of 1 John. And uh, some good stuff in here. So let's start by reading. If you got Bibles, 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Dear friends, don't believe every spirit, John writes, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And this is how we recognize the spirit of God. And this is how you can recognize the spirit of God, John says. Every spirit that acknowledges, recognizes that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that doesn't acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. How many of us know that verse, right? How many of you have quoted that verse? How many of you put that verse on your fridge, right? Some place in your life. He that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. They are from the world, and therefore these false teachers, these antichrists, they speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We are from God, he says, and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Lord, it would be our prayer that you would fill us with your spirit today, that we might see and understand this truth, that we wouldn't just gather together and study information. It wouldn't just be new knowledge and new information about the Bible, but instead that this would be inspiration. Because we study your word to know you better. We study your word to be more in line with your heart and your will. And I know you have a specific will for each person, a specific desire for each person, a, a plan and a path for each person here this morning. And Lord, it would be our desire that we'd be in line with that. So give us eyes to see your truth this morning. Give us ears to hear it. Well beyond just what we can understand, but what your spirit can help us understand. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we look at these verses, and that's all we're going to look at this morning because there's a lot here. This much we know. In this world, people choose to build their lives on a certain foundation, right? They choose to build their lives, and whether or not they articulate it like that. You don't often hear people say, hey, what are you building your life on? What foundation do you have? But the truth is, Jesus talked about people who build their lives on the solid rock of him, Jesus Christ, his truth. And people who build their lives on the shifting sand is what he called it. The stuff of this world. The ways of this world. And if you stop and think about the, the ways and the different foundations that people build their lives on, there's a whole host of different mentalities and philosophies that people have. You're, you're, you'll hear people say, you know what, for me, the most important thing is I want to learn and I want to become successful in life. I want to do something big with my life, and success to me is the most important thing. Have you ever met anybody who the most important thing in their life is to be successful? To do something big with their life? doesn't have to be a bad thing, but if it's in place of doing what God wants you to do, I think it can be a horrible thing. There are others who say, you know, uh, he who dies with the most toys wins, right? And, and though that's not a mantra that we really talk about, it is a mentality, a foundation that people do. They want to not only be successful, they want to get as much stuff and be as successful and have as much things in their life as they possibly can. We've seen people like that. And money is everything to them. There are others who say, the foundation I want to build my life on, the way that I want to live my life. And young you know, youth here this morning, 
This is something that you want to be careful with. There are those who say, in life, the way that I want to live is whatever makes me happiest. Whatever I do, whoever I hang out with, whatever I get, it's all about what makes me the happiest. And you notice that that's a me-centered philosophy or foundation in life. Everything revolves around that person. People revolve. Situations revolve. Others and all the different stuff. It's very narcissistic. No, nobody likes the term a narcissist. But whatever makes you the happiest oftentimes can be. And others say, you know what? I'm going to live for here and now. This is all there is. We've got 24 and 7 and maybe 80, maybe 90 or 60 or who knows. But this is all there is and I'm going to live for this world and I'm going to do as much and experience as much and go as much and do as much as this world can offer me in my life. It has very much the similar idea of whatever makes me the happiest. But as Christians, I hope this has happened for you. As Christians, you're not about success primarily. You're not about stuff primarily. You're not about your happiness, your happiness primarily. I mean, if ever you want to tank your marriage, if ever you want to extract from somebody all the happiness they can give because you stood there on the altar and you thought, this person is responsible to make me happy. And if this person doesn't make me happy, um, if ever you want to put pressure on your relationship and on your spouse, if you want to turn them into a mouse, then that's how it is that you want to live your marriage. And it's not the right way. As Christians, we realize that God has come and God wants to use our life for his glory. I mean, I, I say it all the time. I pray it all the time. Our lives, the Bible says, are not our own, right? We belong to Jesus Christ. And the moment that we put our faith in Jesus Christ, hopefully our desire comes to say, Lord, what's your will for my life? What do you have for me to do? What things do you want me to accomplish? When I was growing up, I wanted to be a developer. That's all I wanted to do when I studied every developer. I lived in Washington State, a developer named Duane Hagedon. He owns all of Colorado, or all of uh, Idaho. He owns all of, what, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I was very much impressed by this guy. And then all of a sudden, I gave my life to Christ at 20 years of age, and I didn't care about developing. I wanted to go into the ministry and preach God's word. And six months before that, if you had said, you're not going to be a developer, you're going to be a pastor? I would have looked at you and said, yeah, right. What are you, stupid? But Jesus has a way of grabbing hold of our hearts and saying, here's what I made you for. Here's what I want you to do with your life. Here's how I want to use the struggles that you've had in life. Here's how I want to use the challenges that you've had, the successes that you've had, and the failures that you've had. Do you realize that Jesus Christ can use everything in your life for his glory? And we stop and we think about that and say, what about my mistakes? Uh, oftentimes, those are the biggest things that God can use as you learn from those and people learn from your mistakes and you grow from your mistakes. Are, are, we, are we awake this morning, right? <laughs> this, is, this is the heart. This is the desire for us to build our foundation on. This is how it is that we live. And Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus claimed to be somebody that we could build our lives on. He claimed to be a foundation that we could build our lives on. Now, just as much as Jesus claimed to be the way, the truth, and the life, he also said on the flip side that Satan is the father of lies, right? He's the truth, and Satan is the father of lies. Always has been, always will be. You go back to the beginning. Adam and Eve believed his lies when they ate the fruit in the garden. David believed the father of lies when he thought as king that he could have an affair and cover it up by murder. Samson believed the lie of the enemy when he, though he knew he wasn't supposed to marry outside of Israel, he was hot after this girl named Delilah, right? We don't often see Delilahs in the world today. And he thought he could make it work, and it didn't really work out for him. And uh, over and over we see people who were deceived by Satan. Judas believed the lie when he betrayed the very Son of God. And you see, Satan specializes in counterfeiting the truth with lies. And that's really as we read 1 John chapter 4, 1 to 6, that's really what John the Apostle, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants us to understand. That Satan is still counterfeiting God's truth, and the truth 
that we can build our lives on. He's counterfeiting that with the lies that he so often promulgates and proliferates in life. Now, I know I don't have to tell any one of us how many fakes and phonies there are in this world because the world, this world thrives on fakes and phonies. Every Christmas, all the news sources, every time a gift season, gift buying season rolls around, so many news sources like to do stories on how to tell the difference between fake gifts that people want and real gifts that people want, right? MSN often does that. If you've ever been to Mexico and some guy comes up and says, you want to buy a Rolex? Yeah, how much? Oh, 150 bucks for a Rolex. You're like, really? And you realize when he opens up his jacket that maybe these aren't genuine deals, right? I mean, our world copies, our world counterfeits. We have counterfeit clothes. We have counterfeit perfume, counterfeit sunglasses, counterfeit you name it. Because it's all about fakes and phonies. And the truth is, hold on to your Bibles because counterfeiting is not just about stuff. But as we can read, the Bible says there are also spiritual counterfeits or fakes. And in the spiritual world, in the body of Christ, the church, the Bible tells us there are two kinds of phonies. Two kinds of fakes or posers. The first is false believers. And the second is false teachers. And there are a whole lot of warnings about both of those in the word. And behind both of them lurks the father of all lies, our enemy. And that's really why he says, beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits. And in order to understand what that meant, you've got to understand their situation. You've got to grasp it. Because in the early church, it was made up of primarily house churches. They didn't have big buildings built, filled with people. They had people that would go and meet in homes in the Roman Empire because for the first couple of hundred years, Christianity was nothing you could do out in the open until, what, 348 or whenever Constantine accepted Christ? Before that, it, they were house churches, secret churches. That's why they had the symbol of the ichthus because then you could know, oh, they're a believer in Jesus Christ. And so they would have these house meetings. And they would have itinerant preachers. They didn't have New Testaments like we do, or they didn't have the whole Bibles like we do. They didn't have the privilege of sitting down and opening up and reading all 66 books of the Bible. They had maybe some doctrine that they heard about. They had stories that they had heard about. And preachers, itinerant ones, would come in and tell stories about Jesus Christ and some of the doctrine and the truth. In fact, Paul the Apostle had a couple of people he sent out, like Timothy and like Titus and Silas. He sent them out to some of these churches to speak the truth. And then you had others that would go out. Even John would send people out, some of his disciples. So it was very easy for someone to show up at one of these house churches. And it was very easy for them to say, hey, I have the authority of the Apostle Paul. He sent me. And here's what I want you to hear. And suddenly these folks could then start to spew all of these lies, all of these falsehoods, all of these things that had nothing to do with God's word and that was their situation they had their pharisees they had their sadducees they had their judaizers they had their gnostics and today we have our jehovah's witness we have our mormons we have our christian science and all the like and they're all trying to do the same thing folks they're all trying to lead people away from god's truth and so again he says don't believe every spirit but test the spirits whether they are from God. And John gives us, I like it when he makes it simple, right? I, I like to preach by put, putting the cookies on the bottom shelf. I like to teach to the majority of people instead of trying to teach up over people's heads. And John does the same thing here. He gives us two simple tests to tell the difference between somebody who is speaking truth from God and somebody who is trying to lead people astray derived from our enemy. And the first test that he gives us, look at it with me, is the test of what they say about Jesus Christ. That is the most important test that you and I need to learn to practice when anybody comes sharing truth with us. Some new thing they learn, something that has changed their life. The first test that we want to do is ask, what does it say about Jesus? And already once, John has warned his readers against the presence of antichrists, little a, among those who had gone out from him back in chapter 2. 
And now he's going to direct a second warning to his followers, to us, readers as well. This time it's not against the spirit of Antichrist, who even now, or this time it is against the spirit of Antichrist, who he says now even inspires false prophets. And listen to what he says. This spirit is an all-out opposition to Jesus Christ and what he stands for. So yes, the spirit of the Antichrist, it refers to Satan specifically, our enemy. He is the father of lies. He's always done the same thing, leading people away from the truth. How many of you know and believe that Satan is alive and well here on earth today? I hope you do. I hope you believe and know. And I'm going to shine light on some scriptures that will challenge that reality in a moment. But he is continuing to lead people away from Christ, which is what the term means, anti-Christ. Yes, this anti-Christ, spirit of anti-Christ, refers to Pharisees and Sadducees and teachers of the law. Jesus had some of the most harsh things to say about them because he knew what they were doing. He knew they were taking people away from God's truth, away from coming to know him, and they were continuing to fill them with lies. Yes, it refers to communism. Yes, it refers to Karl Marx throughout history. Yes, it refers to Stalin, the spirit of Antichrist. Yes, it refers to Hitler. Yes, it refers to Darwin, to Sartre, to Nietzsche. Yes, it refers to Ted Turner. And the spirit includes all of those who have ever been anti-Christ. And even ultimately to the final anti-Christ when he comes on the scene. And the Bible tells us a lot about what he's going to do, right? And how many people he's going to lead astray and confuse and all the rest. And it's critical, folks, that we not believe every spirit. That we test the spirits because, as John says, not all spirits are from God at all. And before I get into this, I want you to grasp what John is not saying about testing the spirits. Because some Christians believe what he's telling us to do is to be cynical, to be critical, and to doubt everything. Always be pessimistic. When, everybody, when anybody comes, starts sharing you with the truth, then you need to look at them and you need to think, I don't believe you. And you need to start from a negative viewpoint. You need to be cynical. You need to be pessimistic. You need to be doubtful. And that's not what John's saying because that will overtake your spirit. And suddenly you'll start to see everybody through this lens of he's a liar. She's a liar. Uh, what are they saying wrong? I know there's something wrong in there. Just give them long enough to talk and we'll find something wrong, right? That, that's not the spirit that God wants us to have. That's not what it means to test the spirits at all. Instead, he tells us to test things and there's a big difference. So what does it mean to test the spirits? And I want you to realize it's the first time that this word test occurs in John's writings. Though it exists 22 times in the rest of the New Testament, Paul challenged his churches to do it often. 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, test all things and hold fast what is, notice how he buffets that, hold fast what is good. I mean, we're told to believe the best, right? We're not told to doubt everything, but we are told to test things, to make sure if it's of God or not. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3.10, he said, speaking of leaders in the church, let these, the leaders, also first be tested, then let them serve as deacons. So first off, all on a general level, it means to examine them against the word of God. Examine people. And frankly, I believe it should be our MO no matter who we're listening to. If you're listening to me, don't take what I say carte blanche. If you're listening to a Bible study leader, if you're listening to a, a, a book or, or on tape, or if you're reading something, does what they say line up with God's word? That needs to be something we're always asking ourselves, which it obviously, a precursor to that it's precipitated on the fact that we know God's word, yes? If you're going to test what I have to say, and if I start to say something that starts to drift off into this nebulous, uh, that doesn't sound quite right. You know, because really what you and I need to do is live our lives with the, the way that makes us feel happy. I want you to be happy, and I want you to make decisions based upon your happiness. And your happiness is really important. And so if somebody doesn't make you happy, don't be around them. If, if your job doesn't make you happy, quit. If God's not making you happy, well, then go find something. Did you, did you hear all that? Did you know what I was doing? Or did you want to get up and walk out? Because if anybody 
someone you trust or not, someone you've heard preach for 10 years or not, if anybody starts to go, and I've, I've heard about pastors, and I've seen pastors that people have trusted for years, and they get this idea. One pastor in the local area, uh, he started to believe that everybody's saved, that, nobody, that nobody's going to hell, that there is no hell. And he started to teach that everybody's saved. And, and suddenly, people who had trusted this man for years started to hear this, and some of them were like, well, you know, he's a good guy. We've believed him for so many years. And others are saying, I don't care how well I know Jimmy John. That doesn't, that's a fake name. I don't know, it doesn't line up with God's word. And if it doesn't line up with God's word, folks, that's the test. What does it say about Jesus Christ? Because Jesus came to die on the cross for sins, which mean people accept Jesus or they reject Jesus. And if you reject Jesus, then it's going to be a hot place for eternity. And if you accept Jesus, it's going to be a good place for eternity. Right? There is a truth. And so we want to measure everything that we hear against God's word. And in, in our world today, there exists way too much what I call skyscraper theology. One story on top of another story on top of another story. And people come up with stories all the time. Oh, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. And this is what God is like because my experience, it, it doesn't jive with God's word, but my experience is what I experienced, and it's my story. And so someone shares a story. And then another story that's not in line with God's word. And suddenly we have this theology about who God is, this skyscraper theology that is not in any way jiving with God's word. And so we test the spirits. We test it against the word of God. And when different people come knocking at our doors, we can test everything they say against the word of God. And we can also test the spirits by doing what John tells us here in verse 2. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that doesn't acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Notice what it all hinges on about Jesus. And where do we learn about Jesus? God's word. You're not going to read about Jesus from any periodical, from any magazine there at the checkout at your supermarket, are you? There, I see sometimes something about Jesus on those, and it's always wonky and just way out there. We learn about Jesus from God's word. Every spirit, verse 3, that doesn't acknowledge Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. Simply put, folks, if anyone claims another Jesus or a different Jesus or a Jesus on steroids or a Jesus that will help you get better gas mileage or whatever they might claim, then we can know that that spirit is not of God. Why? Because the spirit that is of God always glorifies the Son of God. The Holy Spirit will always point people to Jesus Christ. Always will. Jesus said as much in John 15, verse 26. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify, Jesus said, of... He'll speak about me. He'll point people to me. The Holy Spirit doesn't point people to himself. The Holy Spirit doesn't point people to churches. The Holy Spirit doesn't po point people to conferences or seminars. Those things can all be fine, but the Holy Spirit points people to Jesus Christ. That is his mission. And John 16, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you, the Holy Spirit, into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, read that from Jesus, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. Jesus said, he, the Holy Spirit, will glorify me, speaking of Jesus, for he will take of, my, of what is mine and declare it to you. You see, the Spirit that is from God and those that are full of God's Spirit will point people to and glorify Jesus Christ. Here at Vista Church, the hero of this church, the, the, the highest thing that I want anybody to see is not walking out and saying, oh, wasn't that a great sermon? Or, oh, wasn't that a great worship set? Or, oh, isn't that a great church full of a whole bunch of cool things they do? The hero of Vista Church always has been, always will be Jesus Christ. He is the thing we will always hold up. We will point people not to ourselves, not to how cool we are, not to how many campuses we have. We will point people to Jesus Christ because he saves lives. He forgives sins. 
He puts people on a destiny and a path that he has for them that, folks, you want to find and you want to follow. Amen? It's always about Jesus Christ. Always needs to be about him in our lives and what we say and, more importantly, what we do. Hopefully, our lives will point people to Jesus Christ. Whenever I do marriage counseling with people, and uh, I'm doing some right now with a new couple, it's really cool. And the thing is, is every couple wants to be happy in marriage. You know, I mean, that's normal. They want to be happy. Nobody gets married and say, I hope this person makes me miserable. Right? I mean, that's just jacked up if that were the case. But the couple, the husband or the wife, they're not fully responsible to make someone happy. They can't because they're a sinful human being, right? Two sinners coming together, there's going to be friction, right? It's almost comical without Jesus Christ. But Jesus is the one ultimately. And you know what? My biggest prayer for my marriage is not that I would be happy, but my biggest prayer for my marriage is that my marriage somehow, some way, would glorify Jesus Christ, would point people somehow, some way, by the way that Karen and I interact, by the way that we forgive each other, and we've had to forgive each other a lot over the years, by the way that we serve each other, by the way that I cherish my wife. And trust me, we don't get all this perfect, but that's my heart's desire. My prayer is that people would see Jesus Christ in our marriage, and Jesus would be glorified. Anybody else had that desire this morning? I hope you do. I hope that's something you pray for. Yeah, I want to be happy in my marriage. But I think as Christians, the way that we're going to be happiest is by how we are glorifying Jesus Christ with our husband and our wife. It's all about him. And so we've already seen in verse 22 of chapter 2 that this group, this group of false teachers, was having their view of Jesus as they were trying to lead people astray. And who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ, John says in 2.22. And these folks were being challenged to accept a different Jesus, John's readers. A Jesus that wasn't the Messiah. A Jesus that didn't come in the flesh. Those were their issues then. And folks, the father of lies is really just one trick pony because he's doing the same thing today. He's leading people astray today in much the same way because we are challenged today to accept a Jesus who's different. A Jesus who was the brother of Satan, as the Mormons want to say. Is that the true Jesus? But how many Mormons believe that Jesus is the brother of Satan? How many believe that lie? A Jesus, some would say, who wasn't truly God as the Jehovah's Witnesses want to say. Now, trust me, I'm not trying to lambaste any group of people, but I am trying to point out falsehood. I have no problem standing and saying, if someone says Jesus was not the Messiah like the Jehovah's Witnesses say, that's a lie straight from the enemy. You got to realize that. We have to be able to see that. Others would say Jesus was a good teacher and a good leader, but not the Son of God. Others would say Jesus, he's going to make you wealthy. He's going to make you healthy and prosperous, rich and powerful in this world. And those are what the prosperity teachers want to say. Is that what Jesus taught? Why do we want to try and formulate a different Jesus? Jesus didn't teach that he would make you healthy, wealthy, and wise. Jesus said of himself, I have no place to lay my head. He was okay with that. (laughs) I'm glad we have a home. How about you, right? The reality is, folks, people would even say Jesus is not just the only way to heaven. He's one of many ways to heaven, as so many different religions say. And here's what's doctrinally true about Jesus. That the man Jesus of Nazareth is indeed the divine word of God, as he claimed to be, and as John writes in his gospel. That Jesus Christ, secondly, was and is fully God as well as fully human. You can read these on our statements of faith on our website. And that thirdly, Jesus, hear this one please, is the sole source of eternal life since he alone reveals the Father to us and Jesus Christ alone atones for our sins. So if a prophet or a teacher or a pastor or an author proclaims to you any other Jesus, don't listen to him. Now, what if I didn't know about all that when I accepted Jesus? How many of you knew the totality of who Jesus Christ is before you put your faith in him? The answer would be none of us. How many of us knows the totality of who Jesus Christ is no matter how long we've walked with Jesus? I'm pretty certain the answer should be none of us, right? We're all still learning about who Jesus Christ is as we study his word. 
We're still discovering new truth about him as we go through trials and watch him come alongside of us and all the things that he does. And that's why John says in verse 4, you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And so if someone cries out at a point in their life to accept Jesus Christ and they say, Jesus saves me, I, save me, I, I believe you're real, I need you in my life. But like I said, they can't articulate every truth about Jesus. Does it mean that they aren't saved? I, I personally don't think so. I think now they begin a relationship with Jesus where they begin to discover who he is. Now they begin to have a hunger for God's word. How many of you, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, began to have a hunger for God's word? Began to want to study it and read about it and come to church where we say, open your Bibles. Because that's where we discover. And those are things that happen in us. But it doesn't mean that we know everything about the truth because John is talking to believers about those who want to lead us astray, about the enemy who wants to lead us astray, teachers and prophets and pastors and leaders. They better be teaching the word of God and they better be teaching the true Jesus Christ or they better be get ready to be sized for a nice big millstone to be hung around their neck and I hope they're good swimmers, right? Right? Because that's what Jesus said. We're going to be judged based upon what we teach and what we teach people about God and where we teach them to go in, in their relationship with the Lord. And you know, when it comes to the believers that John is writing to, he reminds them of the truth. He reminds them that God is with us, that we are from God, of God, he says, part of his family. He says that we've overcome these false prophets. He said that the spirit of Almighty God in you is greater than the spirit of Satan who is in the world. He, Jesus, in us is mightier, he's louder, he's stronger, he's weightier. And he says he who is in the world is a created being, and the one that is in us is the creator of all of the universe. He is God Almighty. How many of you say amen to that this morning? God in us. We're not God. We don't fan the flame of God. We're not little G's, God. You know, we're not trying to bring out our godness. It's God in us. And that is the truth. And here's the second test as I close. The world will love false teachers. They will love them. 1 John 4, verse 5, they are from the world. And therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. And the world listens to them. We're from God. And whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God doesn't listen to us. And this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. False teachers have just enough Jesus to make people listen, but behind the facade, they're really all about the world. They have just enough Jesus, just enough truth to make people at least, oh, what's that about? That sounds kind of right, but it's not, when you start to look into it, it's not all of God's truth. And the, the reality, John says, is these false teachers will be a massive hit with the world. And John frequently refers to the world 24 times in his letter. And in some cases, he sees the world as a place of benign unbelief. Because remember, God loves this world, right? He knows this world is filled with unbelief. And so he sent his son into this world to show people the truth that they might believe in him. And they're just not there yet. There's a whole lot of people out there in this world who aren't horrible people. In fact, God loves these people. They just don't know the truth yet. Are you glad that somebody took a chance on you and shared the truth with you? Looked at Brandon and said, well, he, he's, he's a messed up dude, but he just doesn't know the truth yet. And, I, and I'm going to keep sharing Jesus with this guy. And, and we want to see people like that, folks. We want to see the world because God loves this world. And we want to see people as what we like to call them pre-believers, right? Give them a chance to accept the Lord. That's why we say no one left behind in our value statement on the back here. Our heart's desire is that anybody that might accept Jesus Christ would come to know him and not be left behind when Jesus Christ returns. We want to see people come to know Jesus Christ. And so John also sees the world, he says, as a place of genuine hostility to God. A place where the forces of evil and falsehood are united together against Jesus and his followers in fact, as we'll see in a couple of weeks in 1 John 5, 19, he says that the world is under the power of the evil one. So it really comes as no surprise that the false teachers 
and those opposed to Jesus would find a colossal reception and following from the world. And you look at some pastors and religious leaders today with huge followings, huge churches. And with this, this test in mind, you examine what are they really teaching? Does it line up with God's word? Oh, I see masses of people, but what are they really teaching? Because we see the masses of people and we think, well, so many people following them. How could that many people be wrong? But John says the world hears them. Some would say, well, yeah, no, the, 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 it's a massive church or a massive author. He has all these books. How many people buy their books and listen to what they have to say? And look at what John says. There is a spirit of error, which means the color of their litmus paper, it didn't come out right, right? It, it didn't measure up. And that's why Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, for the time will come. Hear this, folks. In the last days, the time will come when men and women, people, will not put up with truth, sound doctrine, Instead, to suit their own desires, what makes me happiest, they will gather around them a great number of what? Teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Just tell me what I want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to what he calls myths or stories. We're going to see more and more and more of that, folks, as Jesus wanes his return, as we wait for him. More and more people being led astray by not sound doctrine and the truth, but things that people want to hear. So we ask the question, are destructive spirits and the spirit of Antichrist at work in the world today? Are they at work in the church today? And there's no doubt that they are. And that's why this challenge by John, it fits like a glove for our generation since there are so many competing claims to religious truth today, from cults to sects, to new religious movements. The landscape is thick with challenges to the truth. And here's the rub. Our society prizes religious tolerance and pluralism to such a degree that many have begun to believe that if we really test the spirits, it betrays a narrowness of vision that's overly critical and even judgmental. And folks, I'm not promoting that we be judgmental and critical of people, of people's hearts necessarily, we don't need to look down our noses at them and click our tongues, but here's what we must do. We must be on guard and test whatever comes down the pike to measure it against God's word. What do they say about Jesus, and what does the world say about them? Never forget what Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, alert and aware is what it means. Because your adversary, the devil, he walks around like a roaring kitty cat, right? He just wants you to pet him. He just wants you to cuddle with him. He's really a good guy. No, he rock, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may chew up to pieces, to kill, steal, and destroy in their faith, who he may take and rip them off and rip them apart and rip them away from God's word and God's truth in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Satan is in that kind of business, folks. Do you believe that this morning? And the reality is we need to remember the truth, that he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. Amen. Father, we're thankful for your word this morning, for six simple verses that shine so much light and so much truth on what it is you want us to be about, how you want us to live our lives in these last days as believers in Jesus Christ, knowing your truth, believers who are building our relationship with you, able to discern and critically th think through people who are trying to lead us astray from your truth and from your will and plan for our lives. And so we continue to study your word. We continue to gather together in your name to learn more about you. And Lord, we continue to come into this place to worship you, to glorify you, and to submit our lives to you. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ that we pray these things. And everybody said, amen. amen.